The last section of today will be on model fitting as optimization. We already saw a small example for that last time uh, where we had to uh, find the best model to predict how long we would run uh, a marathon. And uh, today we will some more examples and uh, dive into, into something, some details uh, that, that we didn't have the time for last time. Uh, so, uh, as you know, model fitting is an important part of machine learning and today uh, many, many concepts, many new concepts uh, that will be important for the machine learning applications in the exercises are introduced today. So, first of all, let's get away from the, the uh, models from the last lecture where we only had a point prediction. So, sometimes we are interested in having uh, a model also of uncertainty and uh, not only make point predictions but to work with probability distributions. And um, the concepts of convex optimization oftentimes also translate into treatment of probability distributions and uh, we will see an example for that today. Um, the example we will see today, to give you a heads up already, will be about carbon dating. So in archaeology when we find an, an artifact and we want to find out how old this artifact is, uh, some uh, measurements are taking place and then um, a, a prediction or uh, then we estimate how, how old this artifact is. And there, convex optimization is involved and uh, today we will see how, how that is the case. On this slide, we have two different probability distributions or even two families of probability distributions. So we have the Poisson distribution on the left-hand side and the normal distribution on the right-hand side. And the importance here is that these are families of probability distributions that have parameters. And by adjusting and tweaking these parameters, I can select elements of this family of distributions. So here, families of probability distributions. Um, for the Poisson distribution, which is a discrete dis distribution. Um, I have parameters uh, theta, so this is the vector parameter vector theta, and it has only one element, uh, which we are calling k here. And um, what the Poisson distribution does, it, uh, or it is often used to compute the number of events happening in a certain amount of time. So think about a shop and customers arriving at a shop. And uh, normally the, the customers coming to the shop, they are independent from one and another. So uh, there is no, A being there is not the reason of uh, B being there, so their arrival is independent from one another. And uh, for independent events, oftentimes we see that their inter-arrival time, so the time between two customers arriving, is uh, exponentially distributed. So this is just, um, this follows from their independence. So this exponential distribution oftentimes describes the inter-arrival time for in the independent events. And now if we are not interested in the time between customers, but we are interested in how many customers are arriving, for example, in, in one hour or in 30 minutes, um, so within this time window, then we get the Poisson distribution and uh, it's discrete, so there can only be entire numbers of customers that, that arrive. Um, and uh, the, the parameter for the Poisson distribution here is, is uh, this k. So there's a one scalar, so one dimension of, uh, of parameterization that I can put on this uh, Poisson distribution. And here you see the distribution for different values of k. And uh, for example, if k was 10, in, in the case of the shop and how many customers arriving within an hour, then it would be very likely that 10 customers are arriving within the hour, but with a smaller probability, it could also be that 15 customers or five customers arriving in, within that hour. On the right-hand side, the other distribution is the, the Gaussian. The Gaussian has uh, two parameters that can be set. So here the parameter vector, it has two elements. Uh, mu and sigma, and um, uh, the mu and sigma, they stand for the mean and 
the the standard deviation. So the the variance here would be the square of the standard uh, deviation uh, sigma. Okay, and uh, for the plot here below, uh, mu is zero, so they are all centered around. Oh no, they are centered around ten. So in that case, mu would be ten. And um, we have here different um, standard deviations, and um, as the smaller the standard deviation, the sharper this uh, normal distribution will be. Why is um, the normal distribution important? It has a couple of nice properties. Mathematically, it's, it's easy to deal with, um, but also it occurs oftentimes in nature. And because if one takes the sum of many random variables, um, this, is, uh, this becomes closer and closer to the normal distribution if I increase the number of, of random variables that I'm, that I'm summing up. And this is known as the, as the central limit theorem. And um, uh, even the Poisson distribution, if I make the k really large, it will get closer and closer to something that resembles a, a normal distribution. But for now, let's stick with the Poisson distribution and uh, have a look at how we can um, find out the k that best corresponds to the data that we have observed. So we have here sample samples xi so we have a data set d and uh, d it consists of samples x1 x2 x3 and so on and uh, we assume that these samples are iid so they are independent and identically distributed so they are all independent samples from the same underlying probability distribution so oftentimes this is violated in practice and one has to make sure that um, there is not this assumption underlying the methods that are being used, even if uh, this IID property isn't, isn't the case. But it would be, for example, the case uh, for the customers independently arriving, arriving at the shop, so if there's no relation or, or orchestration between them. Um, and uh, we can now answer the question how well a probability distribution corresponds to the observations in our data set. And for this, uh, uh, the likelihood is defined as follows. We have here um, uh, the number of elements um, in D, and for each element in our data set, uh, we compute the probability of that one result. So here, P theta of xi is uh, the, the probability of that result xi um, as given by, by this probability distribution. And we, we multiply over all of these uh, probabilities. And so this gives us a measure. If li is very small, then the probability distribution probably does not well describe uh, the, the data set xi. And if the likelihood is a bit larger or becomes larger, then there is a closer match because what actually was observed was predicted with a higher probability. However, the likelihood function itself is not a probability distribution. So if it gets larger, then it's more likely that the uh, parameters um, or that the, the distribution describes the, the data set, but it's in itself not a probability distribution. Um, what is important here, now the D is fixed. We have a fixed data set D and what we are changing are the model parameters or the probability distribution parameters theta. And changing over this theta, we ask ourselves for which of these theta is the likelihood um, maximized. Uh, but the likelihood itself is not a probability distribution even though likelihood and probability are related. And uh, the reason for that is that the integral, um, or this expression here, the integral over all likelihoods, uh, over the space of possible model parameters, this is not one, or not in all cases one, uh, but uh, um, it would have to be one if it was a probability distribution, 
Um, so likelihood is related to probability, but it is not a probability in that sense that uh, if we integrate over all possible results, we get one. So we maximize over the likelihood function to get parameters uh, theta that correspond best with the data. And um, while here we are maximizing, we can just use the negative likelihood to turn that into a minimization problem uh, because our Newton method we saw earlier, it wants to do minimization, so we just turn it into a minimization problem. One remaining issue is now is that um, multiplying many small probabilities, so here multiplying the probabilities and all probabilities will be smaller than one, this quickly becomes a very, very, very small number. And this um, um, gives us some computational issues. And uh, so what we do instead is we minimize the negative log likelihood. So the taking the logarithm, um, this is an operation that preserves convexity. Last time we saw uh, all, the, all the building blocks from which we can um, make a, create a, a convex function. And uh, the logarithm is one operation that preserves convexity. So the minimizer of the negative likelihood is also the minimizer of the negative log likelihood. And by using the log likelihood, the product up here, it turns into a sum. And uh, this uh, here in general is a lot nicer to handle than the raw likelihood. Uh, so we are minimizing the negative log likelihood. So, going back to the example of carbon dating, uh, what is we want to achieve? First of all, we are making observations. So, we want to date the, the, the archaeological artifact. And for that, we observe how many decay events of this C14 um, element, or this C14 atoms, uh, can be observed. So, in every living creature, every living element is accumulating this C14 and uh, the content of C14 will then reduce over time because there is this radioactive decay and um, there is some half time and um, so over time the, the, the content of C14 will, will reduce. And we can uh, take a fixed um, uh, number of, of gram of this material or a fixed number of, 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 of mole of, um, of molecules of, of that material and uh, observe how many of these decay events are happening in a certain amount of time. So you can take a Geiger counter and you count how many decays are observed in a certain amount of time. And uh, because of all the atoms inside the material, they are uh, their probability of decaying individually is uh, not related. So uh, this is like the customers that are independent from one another when they arrive in, in, in a shop. And uh, here it's quite similar. So also the number of decays follows a Poisson distribution. And the question is, what is the K, the parameter K of this Poisson distribution that best describes um, the, the decays that, or the number of decays that we have observed. So here on the right hand side in this image you see um, for a different number of uh, observation periods how many decays were, were observed. So um, we have sometimes observed um, uh, two events, sometimes we have observed four events and so on. And um, uh, we also see the Poisson distribution uh, for, for different k, and the question is which of these k, or which other k, uh, best describes here the distribution of uh, observations that, that we have made. And uh, for that we are minimizing the negative log likelihood. So here the negative log likelihood of this Poisson distribution, uh, when we expand that to, to this term, and uh, we can even pull out this K, pull, put it on in front, and uh, we get to a final optimization problem. So here we are minimizing over all possible K to get the one that uh, best describes the observations. 
and from that we can infer the age of the archaeological experiment. So here the negative log likelihood is, is this function here and we are minimizing, we are selecting here the k star, our minimizer, and from that we can get back to um, the, the table or the, the function of the, uh, of the exponential decay where if, if after every half life of um, the uh, C14 um, the, the material or the, 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 the quantity of C14 is halved and uh, uh, by having this k we can basically then do a table lookup and find out how old the artifact probably is. Now we are moving on to another type of problems that is often encountered in machine learning. So right now, before, we saw how to fit a probability distribution and now we will look at regression. And uh, regression problems, you can think about this as uh, also prediction problems um, where I have an uh, input-output relation and uh, I have the input and I want to predict the output happening. Uh, so this is also a type of supervised machine learning because I have labeled data, the input and the output of past examples are available to me in my data set. And there are large groups of, uh, of uh, models uh, that can be used for regression and the, the two biggest categories are the parametric and the non-parametric models. So parametric models have a finite set of uh, parameters and uh, they have therefore also bounded complexity and uh, the non-parametric models there the number of parameters of the model can grow especially can grow in the number of observations that are available to me so here uh, in general I have higher computational and storage requirements but when I have more data I can also get to a more and more precise model so uh, two examples for the non-parametric models are kernel regression and k-nearest neighbor regression. Uh, for the kernel regression, I uh, have the, the, uh, the data points that were, um, that were measured. And um, then if I want to evaluate a new data point, let's say I have a new data point I want to evaluate here, then I take a look at the distance to the other elements that were observed around that. And, uh, depending on the distance to the new data point that I want to evaluate or where I want to predict, I am then producing a, a weighted sum of the, of the elements uh, of the observations, the output of the observations around that. And uh, k-nearest neighbor regression is, uh, is similar to that, only here I, I uh, define ahead of time that I want to have exactly k-nearest neighbors that uh, I want to look at and then either average or also uh, take a sum weighted somehow by, by the distance. Okay, but today we put more of a focus on the parametric models. Uh, these can be classified into linear and nonlinear uh, types of models. So uh, we say that a model is linear if it is, uh, in this case, linear with respect to the model parameters. So if I uh, change the model parameters, um, how much does that impact the um, output of the model? And uh, on the other hand, uh, nonlinear, um, so um, examples of, of nonlinear regression are, for example, neural networks that have a nonlinear activation function. And um, the, the problem with nonlinear regression oftentimes is that there is no cross form solution available. So we have to resort to numerical optimization and uh, there are possibly local minima of uh, the so-called loss function. So for the non-parametric and so for the non-linear regression, this is a parametric model, but if they are non-linear, then I can also be stuck in some local minimum if I try to optimize the, the model parameters. And um, uh, more, more details on that will, will follow right now. So, for the linear regression, what we usually do is we combine an underlying set of basis functions. So here we have our model M theta that we want to find. And uh, we have again labeled data with input-output relations. So we have x as input, y as output. Uh, 
and uh, we want to select our model parameters theta so that the input and output in the observations are closely predicted uh, by the model. And uh, for this model uh, m theta, we are combining a finite number of basis functions. So here uh, the basis functions are phi, phi j. And um, what is done in the model is we take the sum, the weighted sum of the basis functions evaluated at the point that I want to predict. So I want to get out here, epsilon is the output of this model and uh, we sum over the basis function and weight every result by the uh, appropriate element of the, of, the, uh, of the model parameter vector theta. So here actually we just have a, a vector uh, uh, multiplication uh, if uh, the output of the phi here is, uh, is a scalar. Now there are a couple of different um, basis functions that can be used, for example the polynomials. So for example if we have a model, um, um, let's say m um, theta of x is, and then we have a constant, so constant plus um, um, theta 1 times x plus theta 2 times x squared and so on. Uh, so these types of polynomial functions um, that would uh, be this type of regression here. But there are also other types of basis functions, for example Gaussian and uh, sigmoidal, and uh, the, the underlying technique is actually uh, is, is, is the same. Okay, and um, now let's do a recap the, of the example from the last lecture. And we will find that here we did exactly such a linear regression with, a, with polynomial basis functions. So given a data set with input-output relations, we have assumed a model class. In this case, we have assumed polynomial of degree 2. So this is an assumption that we make. This is an input that we give into, into the system. We might also make a wrong assumption here. And um, in addition to that, we have uh, selected a, a loss function. So this is also a design choice, which loss function we take. And uh, last time we had selected the mean squared error so that we penalize in our loss function the quadratic distance from the model prediction to the actual observation. And then we minimize um, the, the loss function over the um, over the, the parameters theta to find the best model parameters and in the case of the marathon example we then found a particular set of initial speed and uh, de deceleration uh, that best described the, the observations. Um, but how is the loss actually selected? What, what design choices have we when we uh, select a loss function and uh, this is a design choice that is independent from the selection of the model family. So we have the, the model, the parameterized model M uh, parameterized by theta. And uh, here we select a family, uh, let's say this is an element of big M. So this is the, 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 the space of possible models that we can have. And uh, first we have the design choice of, of models that we are allowing. And then we have a second design choice of the loss function that we want to use. So the, the mean squared error, we have already seen that. I will not explain that again, uh, but there are two alternatives I want to highlight here. The first one is uh, the so-called linear loss, where um, I just take the absolute distance between the, uh, the model prediction and the actual observation. And um, it has uh, one advantage, which is that it's more robust compared to outliers. So if I have outliers that are far out, uh, where the model pre predicts really, uh, where, 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 let's say if here, if I have um, my data, and usually the prediction is quite good, but there are some cases where I have large outliers uh, in my data set, then if I choose the linear loss, um, it is more robust for these outliers 
because I'm not here squaring the distance um, in, in, my, in my loss function. Uh, but there is also one disadvantage and uh, the disadvantage here is that I cannot compute a gradient of uh, the loss function um, in some cases or where it's a little bit more difficult. So if I, if I take the absolute, uh, I can um, more easily um, run into computational problems. Uh, if I have uh, yi minus m theta of xy squared, this is perfect. I always have a nice gradient. Uh, if I take the absolute, then in some cases I don't have a gradient when I'm exactly at the point where, where this guy here evaluates to zero. Uh, because coming from the both from either side, uh, the, the, the gradient I'm seeing will be different, and so mathematically the gradient is undefined at uh, the exact point where, where this is zero. Okay, um, another example is the Huber loss, and um, the Huber loss is um, um, it's, uh, it's a mixture between the linear, linear and the mean squared loss. So uh, here we have the linear loss and um, the uh, mean squared loss. And uh, the Huber loss is a mixture between the two because initially, up to, until some additional parameter omega that I have to choose, uh, it, will be, it will be curved. And then starting here out, f uh, from, from, out from this point here, so this is the point omega, uh, going out from this point here, I will have a, a linear loss. And this combines um, precision and the availability of a, of a gradient close to um, the, the solution and uh, also the robustness with, again, with respect to, to outliers that, that might exist. Okay, so which is the best model or which is the best model class? Uh, so we have um, a model M of theta and that is element of some class of possible models that I'm looking at. And the question is how, how do I select this big M? And uh, this translates in our case into the question um, how many basis functions do I allow? For example, if I approximate a data set by a polynomial, uh, to which degree do I allow polynomials? Do I only allow a uh, constant plus theta 1 x plus theta 2 x squared? And how, how long do I allow this series to continue? Do I also allow a uh, third and fourth degree polynomial or, or at which point do I stop? And um, the problem here is that in, if I'm adding more and more degrees and more and more basis functions, the output on the training data will become more and more precise. Uh, you can think about uh, a low degree polynomial as one having zeros in all of these places in, in the uh, later places. So here I have a zero and here I have a zero uh, and so on. That then would be a polynomial of second degree. And if I uh, make the model class bigger, then I um, will always get a result that is at least as good as with the smaller model class. And um, um, at some point it doesn't make any more sense because there are so many degrees of freedom that my optimization algorithm has that um, it is overfitting so that the, that the model is too much tuned to the data and that it assumes some structure to exist that is not actually there. And here we have um, an example where it's pretty clear that this is coming uh, from uh, an underlying linear process. So we have data that seems to be pretty much exactly on, on some linear function or affine function uh, with some random noise. And um, now if we increase the number of uh, basis functions 
and uh, the, the degree of polynomials that we allow, uh, we get a result that more closely resembles the, the data points, uh, which is also a little bit more, more curved here. So here we have more curvature. Um, and um, this is still somewhat realistic. So it could be that uh, the blue line here is the, is the underlying function. But if we then further increase the number of, uh, of uh, dimensions, so if we here go from, from one to four to eight dimensions, we see that uh, the error is further reduced. So at each individual data point, we have a further reduction of the, of the, of the prediction error. However, if we go outside of the observed data points, very quickly we see that this is completely unrealistic. So nobody would have thought or would think that this uh, line here should continue um, that way by, by bending downwards as much. And if you further increase the dimensionality, it will become more and more unrealistic. But actually, if we look at the individual data points and how closely they are approximated, we are getting better and better. And this is an example for overfitting where um, um, it looks on the training data as if we had an improvement, but actually the model is becoming unrealistic. And um, how do we get around that? So uh, first of all, let's make one important distinction. And uh, this is the distinction between the training data and the test data. So we, we split training data and test data. Uh, oftentimes uh, people take 20% test data and 80% training data or 70 to 30, somewhere around that. And uh, now we measure the model quality on the test data. So if you have taken a machine learning course, you've all seen that. Um, and um, for an increasing number of model parameters, so if n was the dimensionality of uh, or the number of basis functions that we choose, then we would always see uh, that the loss function is decreasing for the training set, but at some point the loss function will start to increase on the test set. And this is where this overfitting sets in. And here we see the example for n equals 2 uh, with the loss for training data and test data and n equals 11, where we have a very low loss on the training data, but on the test data actually we see an increase, so overfitting here has set in. What can we do in those cases? Um, so uh, what is done and what is also a, a design choice that we have to make when we are training our models is whether we are adding regularization. And um, let's see how, for the preceding example, how the actual parameters theta are as they are selected for different um, number of basis functions that are allowed. So if we have only three basis functions that are allowed, these are the, um, the weight vectors with which we multiply each basis function. If we allow for five, it's this. If it's 11, it's this. And typically what one sees is if we have uh, too many degrees of freedom, then the model parameters will become quite large. So here we had at most 24 and here it goes up to several hundred thousand. So what we want to do in order to, to prevent overfitting is to penalize large model parameters. And by that way we can still have um, model classes um, with many many basis functions and prevent overfitting by giving an incentive to rather choose a model where the model parameters individually are smaller. And uh, so this is done here. Um, we have our standard um, mean squared error. And in addition to our standard mean squared error, we have added another term here. So uh, we now look at the individual parameters and penalize them when they get very large. So usually here we would have uh, Q equals two for, for a squared um, regularization. And then we also have to select this mu here. So how strong we want the regularization to be. And uh, this then um, 
further and further by increasing this mu uh, gives an indication that uh, we prefer simpler models. So actually here we are making a trade-off between a very precise model on the training data and the simple model and um, we can select then here uh, this, this, this hyperparameter or this, um, uh, yeah, uh, this, this penalty, how much we weigh that uh, with a regularization and uh, in the exercises of uh, today's lecture, so the exercises will be in two days, um, you will actually use overfitting and see on the original data um, how the impact of uh, setting this value mu and uh, regularization is. So to summarize what you saw today, first of all we repeated some concepts from linear algebra that will occur over and over in this course. We will see, we saw how the Newton method uh, led to some dramatic speed improvements over gradient descent where we went from 130 iterations to one iteration to get close to, to the minimizer. And then we had a look at a couple of aspects concerning um, model fitting. So first we saw how probability distributions can be fitted to observations also by an solving of an optimization problem. We saw how the training of a regression model is expressed as an optimization problem via the definition or the selection of an appropriate loss function and we saw how we can change or add something to that loss function to have a, an additional penalty term to regularize, regularize to prevent overfitting um, when we have very high dimensional uh, model classes that allow for many degrees of freedom compared to, to the size of data that is available. That was all for today. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, see you next week.